Okay, so I think we'll just get, uh, maybe we'll start slowly and see what happens uh, as we get go along here. So I see some of you have teddy bears already, that's really nice. Uh, is that bringing his kind of the uh, Ajahn Brahm tradition? You know, kind of close to Ajahn Brahm, people have teddy bears with them. In our center, have you been to, have you been to Perth? Uh, have you been to Perth? She has, yeah. You have been to Perth? Yes. Yeah, so you know the teddy bear, kind of the way it is in Jana Grove? Yeah, you don't know the, kind of the, the deal, yes, you know how it works, yeah. In Jana Grove in Perth, if you come to us, down there, we have like this really nice meditation center, especially purpose built for meditation. And uh, we have this corner on the monks' asana. Asana is a seat where the monks are sitting. And also on the nuns' side as well, according to Vachanda. That's so far away, I can't see all that way, you know. So but thank you for letting me know. We have this kind of pile of teddy bears, yeah, and teddy. All kind of teddies, not just bears, teddy, teddy this, teddy that. Uh, and so that's really nice. And sometimes at the beginning of treat, everyone is kind of stern. Uh, after a few days, more teddy bears get taken down. And by the end of it, everyone is really soft and kind of <laughs> fluffy with teddy bears, which is nice. I, you know, there's one of those very important things that we often forget when it comes to meditation practice. Uh, this idea of being gentle and having a sense of softness. Uh, yeah, so anything that encourages that is a very positive thing here. And sometimes all you need is to kind of, you know, if you have a teddy bear with you, it kind of reminds you of that idea of being gentle and soft. Uh, that is the kind of mind that eventually leads, you know, allows you to access peace, to access a sense of kindness within, uh, eventually access the samadhi, which is the coming together of the mind. Uh, and that gentleness is a very fundamental part of the idea of the uh, the path of meditation. So if teddy bears come in handy, use teddy bears. If they don't come in handy, okay, don't have to use teddy bears. So whatever, whatever works really here. Yeah, that's kind of the idea here. Yeah. So um, we are going to uh, hopefully have, I, I really like the ground rule. I remember Chandra, the only one ground rule, relax. That's kind of a ground rule. Yeah. We used to have a ground rule in uh, Janagar. The ground rule was, okay, there's, nothing is obligatory. Yeah. Don't have to come to the talks, don't have to come to the meditations, don't have to come to anything. Yeah. Only two things are obligatory on the retreat, uh, breakfast and lunch. Uh, everything else is voluntary. <laughs> and that kind of sets the... And of course, if you go to breakfast and lunch, don't go to anything else. You start coming out for the other things because you feel looked after, taken care of. Yeah, And so it kind of evolves naturally from there when you have this very kind of... Don't have... Don't put expectations very high. I'm just going to eat and sleep for the next nine days. And kind of you, you are in business. So. And uh, so uh, this is kind of the idea of uh, what we're trying to do, the one ground rule to relax. And uh, many of you may have heard this story before, but I, I just told the story the other day. Yeah. And it's this beautiful story of this monk in Thailand, who is one of these kind of super-duper meditators. Uh, his name is Ajahn Ganha. I, I, I mention his name every now and again when I give Dhamma talks. Uh, and he's one of these people with enormous loving-kindness. And he, you know, you go to his monastery, he's full of energy all the time. His eyes are kind of, you know, lighting up. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, and he... Uh, and so sometimes he kind of goes around all day full of energy and then to maybe towards the evening his energy kind of starts to wear off a little bit uh, and he kind of disappears into his room yeah, for an hour and it comes out again beaming. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the, uh, the, uh, you know, the people who have profound access to meditation, they get into deep meditation very quickly and very easily. Yeah. And that's what he does. Uh, and he stayed uh, at Bodhinana Monastery for a few months, a few years back. He's a close friend of Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and after he had been there, uh, yeah, people thought, well, actually, what did he teach regarding meditation? I forgot his meditation technique. He was such a profound meditator. We want to hear his technique of meditation. And so they decided to kind of do a kind of pilgrimage to his monastery in Thailand. So I think Ajahn Brahm went and all of these other people went to Thailand. And so they kind of, you know, finally this large group from Perth traveling all the way to Thailand. From, from the England, it may seem like Thailand and Australia is very close, but from over there, it still seems quite far away, actually. Uh, so it's a long distance to go. And then they come to Ajangana's monastery here, uh, and they say, oh, could you please, you know, we'd like to get some meditation instructions because we recognize you as a meditation master here. Uh. And so he gives the meditation instructions. Uh, and he says, uh, breathe in, sabai, breathe out, sabai. Please, we want to hear more meditation instruction. No, that's it. That's it. That's the meditation instruction. And sabai means exactly what Venerable Chanda was saying. It means relax, right? Uh, so she forgot the breathe in and breathe out part, but otherwise she got the, got the entire instruction, uh, yeah, what it was about. Uh, and that's kind of 
beautiful. It's so simple. Yeah, it's so simple that we can't follow it usually. It's too simple for us. We don't get simple things like that. We're too complicated to understand simple things. Uh, but that's really what it is about. Uh, yeah, if you can really just be at ease, uh, yeah, you can be relaxed, you can be comfortable, uh, you can enjoy the moment, enjoy the good company, all of these kind of things. Uh, and then you breathe in and out with that kind of attitude. Uh, yeah, that is kind of the idea here. So actually, that is enough instruction if you understand what is going on. Uh, but uh, then, you know, most people will say, please say more, say more. You know, we're not happy, we're happy with that. We want, we want more to kind of, uh, I don't know exactly why you want to know how you can be comfortable. Maybe that's what we need to know. Yeah, How can you actually relax? Uh, many people can't even relax properly here. Uh, and then of course uh, there is an issue there. Uh. So um, that is uh, Ajahn Ganha's instruction, but because my meditation is not as good as Ajahn Ganha's, uh, I talk much more than he does. Uh, so <laughs> so that this is the, so we'll see what happens when I, today. So uh, uh, meditation. I'm going to start talking about uh, meditation in general and also how it uh, combines with the idea of sila. Yeah, the word sila in Pali. Uh, is there anyone here who doesn't know the word sila? Don't know the word sila? Really? Okay, okay. Don't, don't know what the word sila. Okay, so sila is a Pali word. Yeah, you always learn a bit of Pali when you come on my kind of talks because I like the Pali language. Yeah, and I know that people with, are you from Sri Lankan background? Yeah, okay, so Sri Lankan background. So already people with Sri Lankan background of, uh, always know a bit of Pali. They really enjoy a bit of Pali. So these are very basic words uh, in Buddhism and understanding these ideas often means you don't have to translate them every time and explain exactly what it means. It becomes one concept, one idea, and we can take it on board. Uh, so the idea of sila basically means morality, uh, and it, but it means actually much more than what we normally think of as morality in English yeah, or in any other European language. Uh, it has the whole idea of uh, um, how we live our life, yeah, our habits, our attitudes, and all of these things are included in sila. It's like moral habit, if you like. Often in Buddhist countries, when they say sila, they mean the pancha sila, yeah? But pancha sila is only a tiny kind of surface of sila. Sila is so much more than that. Uh, pancha sila is only the beginning here. Yeah? And if all you do is pancha sila, you're not going to go that far here. Yeah? So it's basically, it has to do with our entire attitude to the people around us, our attitude to the world and to ourselves and everything. And basically, it can be summarized, in my opinion, in the word kindness. Uh, yeah, kindness as an attitude to the world around us. And that includes, obviously, acting and speaking with kindness, yeah, avoiding the bad stuff, doing the good stuff. But it also means having a mental attitude of kindness. And this is where the profound meditations of Buddhism, we talk about metta, loving kindness, we talk about karuna, which is the uh, compassion. Uh, yeah? These are the kind of attitudes that we're trying to build up. And at root, in the end, the thing that really makes the sila come together uh, is these ideas of uh, uh, you know, metta and karuna. Because when your mind is transformed in that way, uh, it becomes very difficult to do anything which is unwholesome, uh, anything which is immoral. Uh, you become moral at your core, in a sense, uh, because your mental attitude is there. Uh. And so this is, uh, in a broad scope, the idea of sila, very, very broadly speaking. Uh. So sila as the foundation, yeah, this is kind of what the this is a foundation for meditation. I'll explain as we go through the day exactly how that works. But I want to start with some more basic things. First of all, just to get a meditation going, is anyone here who is fairly newcomer to meditation? Yeah, fairly, okay, fairly newcomer, okay, good, yeah. Okay, thanks. And uh, any experts here? Yeah. <laughs> it's always, no one ever raises their hand when you ask that question, which is good. So uh, actually, probably they probably have a few experts here, like, uh, but maybe, I don't know. It's all kind of relative, what do you, what do you mean by these things? So, so um, um, the idea of meditation, this meditation can obviously be described in many, many different ways. Uh, I'm going to describe it in terms of three qualities uh, yeah, today, and I'll show you why these three qualities are really important. Uh, and this equality is as the idea of letting go, huh? yeah, the idea of enjoyment, huh? and lastly, the idea of mindfulness. Huh? Yeah, letting go, enjoyment, and mindfulness are core ideas uh, for meditation to work. Yeah? And of these three, huh? 
Uh, mindfulness is probably takes a bit of time before we establish mindfulness. Yeah? Mindfulness is something that needs to be established. Uh, very often our mind is kind of a bit, little bit all over the place. Uh, it takes time for that to get established. Uh, so of these three qualities, the more fundamental ones are letting go and enjoyment. Uh, and out of that emerges the mindfulness. Uh, when you read the suttas, you see this in many places. You see one of the most important suttas. Suttas is the word of the Buddha, yeah, the discourse of the Buddha. And so one of the most important suttas when it comes to meditation practice is the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on mindfulness of breathing, yeah? the breath meditation. Yeah? And in that Sutta, it says at the very beginning, and the beginning is often the most important part because it sets the base, yeah? it sets the foundations, it sets the relax foundation, if you like. And uh, what it says there is that, first of all, you establish mindfulness in front of you. Satting parimukkang upatapetva is the Pali for that. Uh, yeah, you establish mindfulness in front of you. You do that before you do mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. Very commonly in the Buddhist world, people go get into a meditation retreat, they sit down and start watching the breath straight away. Please don't do that. Uh, Please make sure your mind is roughly in the right space before you watch the breath. Go to the breath too quickly, all you end up doing is grasping the breath. And when you grasp the breath, it becomes painful after a while. It's not really comfortable because the grasping means that your mind is not relaxed. Your mind is not enjoying what is happening here. And so that is the first step. So you have to establish mindfulness before you can watch the breath. But then I just said a minute ago that mindfulness uh, is, comes later, right? So prior to mindfulness uh, comes the two ideas of letting go and enjoyment. Yeah? Enjoying and letting go. It's like prior to that again. Uh, so to be able to become mindful, uh, we have to understand the ideas of letting go and enjoyment. Uh, and uh, this is not just my idea. Yeah? This is not just, I'm not just saying this kind of randomly. I'm saying this because this is really an outcome of understanding the suttas in the right way. If you understand the suttas in the right way, the word of the Buddha, this is basically what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. And one of these really interesting suttas that I always read out on every retreat, I'm not going to read it out now, I'm just going to kind of tell it to you very quickly. And those of you who know me will have heard this many, many times before. You're going to hear it one more time now. Huh? Please forgive me if you heard many things many times before. I just love to repeat myself ad nauseam. So you're gonna, <laughs> and it's good. Yeah, this is kind of. I think that is actually good to have that repetition because every time is a little bit different. Yeah? And the Buddha also repeated himself very, very frequently. Yeah? And every time you hear it, it goes in in a slightly different way. Yeah? And this sutta is called the Chaitanya Karaniya Sutta. It's to not to or to be done or not to be done by an act of intention or by the will. Yeah? Yeah, this is the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the name of this particular discourse of the Buddha. And in this discourse, uh, he starts off by saying that, uh, uh, first of all, you establish virtue, sila. Yeah? The virtue is established, first of all. The things I was just talking about before, the idea of sila, the goodness of the heart, the living in the right way, all of these kind of things. Uh, and then the Buddha says, when you have that foundation in sila, that is the foundation again, right? And there's a number of places in the sutta as you find the idea of sila as foundation. When you have that foundation, then you have a sense of non-regret. Yeah, you don't regret what you've done. When you don't have a regret, you have joy, pamuja. Yeah, enjoyment, joy and enjoyment. These two words mean pretty much the same thing. Enjoy, enjoy. Yeah, and then from that you have rapture. Rapture is more enjoyment, and then you have tranquility. Yeah, and then you have sukha. Sukha is more, more enjoyment, even more bliss. And so what you see here, and this is what you find again and again in the suttas, not only here, also in the mindfulness of breathing sutta, two qualities throughout. The idea of peace, yeah, and peace emerges from letting go because holding on is the opposite of peace. So letting go, yeah, and the idea of enjoyment and happiness. And so when you look at the suttas, you look at the way the Buddha describes the, if you like, the psychology of meditation, how we experience meditation when it works in its ideal way. And this, I can guarantee you, it's not going to work in its ideal way yeah, for the whole day today, but we try to move towards that ideal. That's the idea. So it is always about these two qualities, yeah, enjoyment and letting go. Tranquility is a kind of comes from letting go. So tranquility and letting go, which also that tranquility and enjoyment, which also is letting go and enjoyment. Yeah, these are the things that you see throughout the suttas. 
And so the Buddha says that, and that's why I like to repeat it. And the Buddha says much more, of course, but these are, if you like, the two kind of core ideas to focus on, on the path of meditation. So letting go and enjoyment. So can you do that? You can? Okay, good. I'm glad you are so optimistic about this because sometimes... Sometimes it is not so easy as we think it is, yeah? But at least you can remember the two, yeah? That's kind of a good start. Actually, you probably can't even remember the two. At the end of the retreat, I ask people, can you remember one word? And everyone says, yes, we can. Of course you can't remember one word. When you get busy in your daily life, you're in with a mobile phone, you're doing all kinds of things, everything goes out of the window, yeah? This is the difficulty with the spiritual life. It's so easy to forget. And I'm supposed to be a monk. I'm supposed to be living this life all the time. I forget all the time. Yeah? I have to be reminded by Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn says, don't do this. Do that. Actually, he never says that. But he probably should, he probably should say that. Ajahn Brahm is this very kind person. He never tells anyone off. And I think that is why he has success with training monastics. Because kindness leads to an automatic kind of discipline. Automatic willingness yeah, to actually take on the rules, etc. of monastic life. And so it, it sounds kind of easy, let go and, and enjoy, yeah? but actually it is not that easy. And sometimes very commonly people ask this question, how do you let go? Yeah, I'm trying all the time, let go, I'm trying, I can't let go. Trying so hard. Well, actually that's the problem. You're trying is kind of the anti-letting go. Yeah? So you're actually getting it wrong straight from the very beginning. Yeah? So I'm going to show you what it means to let go and give you some idea because often it is not explained very well how letting go happens yeah, and what actually it is about. Uh, letting go, first of all, is very gradual. It doesn't happen all at once unless you are a super duper meditation star uh, and there are very few of those around. Uh, actually, uh, probably no one is a super duper meditation star because when you become very, when your meditation becomes very deep, you give up that stardom a long time ago. So there's no, <laughs> no such thing here. Uh. So you have to do the letting go very gradually here. Uh. And the beginning of letting go is actually just relaxation. That is the starting of letting go. Because the reason why we are not relaxed is because the mind is holding on. Yeah? The mind is doing things. The mind is pushing us. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And after a while, you feel a little bit tense because you're following this kind of schedule of stuff that has to be done. And you have to remember it. And you're forcing yourself, forcing your mind onto the things that you have to do. And so the mind then being active, the mind having to do things, and it kind of then, it, uh, it, the um, discomfort establishes itself in the body as well. And then you cannot really relax anymore. So the beginning is always to learn to relax. That is already letting go. Yeah, and this, I don't think people really often get this, that relaxation is let, actually letting go. These are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, isn't that good news? Yeah, we can just relax and letting go. Who, had, who would have thought that? Uh, people think letting go is something completely different. I think letting go is like the world disappearing and entering some kind of different realm. That's letting go. Or maybe that is letting go too, but that's letting go down the track. Yeah? This is up the track, yeah? the beginning of the path. Uh. And so how do you do that? Uh, how do you learn to relax? Uh, and the one way to do it is not to say, relax, relax, relax. Yeah? That doesn't work because that's the kind of non-relaxing uh, relaxation. Uh. Um, so what you have to do instead of saying these kind of things, you have to kind of have some mental attitudes that actually you know when you relax in life. Yeah, and one of the ways of that we often relax is that we know if you are very tired and exhausted, you come back home after a long day's work or whatever it is that you do, and you feel kind of really, wow, I had enough of everything, and you just lie down on your bed or you sit down in your armchair, and you kind of, wow, do nothing, right? What do you do at that time when you just relax in your armchair or on your bed? You don't do anything, yeah? You just allow the world to kind of go through your mind, all the turmoil, you allow it to kind of unravel itself inside of you. And as you just kind of lie there doing absolutely nothing, allowing everything to go, after a while, you actually feel more clarity. You do feel more relaxed. And then you go up and you start over again and doing all those things that make you unrelaxed. Yeah, <laughs> this is the problem, right? So the difference is that what we do, we do that kind of idea of sitting in your armchair and relaxing, but then we take it further. We don't stop there. And then we continually let the letting go process. And that is the difference between the sitting in your armchair and then kind of getting back up again. 
So think of it like that, especially in the beginning of meditation. Okay, I'm just sitting in the armchair. What is that, what is that like to sit in that armchair? Actually, it's really comfortable because I'm just allowing everything to flow, not trying to direct anything, yeah? not doing anything at all. Uh, yeah, and that actually is a very pleasant state already right there because you stop all the doing that we often do in, in life. Uh, so that is one way of thinking about the idea of letting go, yeah, when, you, when we start out in our meditation. Uh, a second way of thinking about the idea of letting go is to think about um, what happens just before you go to sleep at night. Uh, yeah, when you go to sleep at night, uh, what, how do you do that? Uh, well, if you try to go asleep, right, it usually doesn't happen. Oh, I must, must fall asleep. Oh, it's getting late. Oh, I have to fall asleep. And now, and it, because stuff is churning through your mind, you can't really go to sleep. Uh, yes, but usually when you know that moment when you actually go to sleep uh, is usually a moment of letting go. Uh, yeah, it's a moment when actually you don't try anymore. Uh, but, and then when you stop trying and you kind of finally just uh, chill and let everything be, then actually is the time when you actually fall asleep. Yeah? You're not actually, it actually happens by itself. Uh, so that idea is uh, something you can use in meditation. What does it mean at that moment you're about to fall asleep? Uh, yeah? And you go there uh, and then you fall asleep. Uh, Let's see. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Sometimes maybe you do fall asleep, yeah? And if you do fall asleep, no problem. You're allowed to sleep in here. Yeah? And if you snore very, very loudly, we might just tap you a bit on the shoulder and say, okay, snoring too loudly. But, uh, <laughs> but actually it's nice. I often find that kind of, you know, someone snoring at the back of the room, uh, I always feel a sense of uh, kind of compassion, yeah? Is someone really relaxing and really letting go? Uh, and I kind of get a sense of compassion out of that. Uh, so uh, this is you know, very important when we are in a group like this, that we have that sense of compassion and care for each other. Otherwise, it's very easy to get irritated by tiny, tiny little things that actually mean nothing at all. But still, we kind of, you know, what the human mind is like. Yeah. So that is uh, another way of doing it, right? Uh, a third way uh, of... Uh, um, a third way of doing, of kind of letting go, huh? yeah, and this, now we're getting a bit more deep already, huh? and so bear with me. So this is a, a way that is taught by the Buddha a lot, huh? and many of you will be, will be aware of these kind of med techniques the Buddha is using. Huh? This is called the Maranasanya or Maranasati. Huh? Yeah, you know straight away what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah, so Marana Sanya. Marana is death uh, in the Pali language, uh, and Sanya is perception, and Sati is recollection. So, recollection of death uh, or perception of death. Uh, yeah, and this is the idea of bringing in the idea of death into the present. Uh, yeah, the idea that if you are going to die, you're going to have to let go. Yeah, you cannot hold on to this world when you're dying. Uh, yeah, you cannot, I know everyone tries to do that, they try to bring everything with them. And that's a very interesting thing. You go around the various cultures of the world and you see people doing desperate things to try to take all the things with them in this life into the next life. It, almost every culture has this. I don't know about Finland, but most, many, many cultures have this. Certainly in Norway they have this, this idea. If you go to the, uh, China, it's very famous, even today, you go to a funeral of people who have a Chinese background, uh, and they have, sometimes they have this little paper money that they burn at the funeral. Uh, paper money, paper car, paper house. And the idea, if you burn these things, the smoke goes up, the smoke goes to heaven, and somehow the money reconstitutes in heaven, then you have lots of money in heaven, uh, yeah? And a big house and a nice car. Uh. And the Vikings also did that, yeah? That's why I was taking, talking about the Norwegian culture, because they too did that, you know, when the kind of great Viking chieftain died, they would take his longbow to put all the stuff into the longboat and whack his wife in there as well. The wife, no, I don't want to die, take me out. <laughs> okay, sorry, you have to go with your kind of your husband, yeah? You're now going to Valhalla. I don't want to go to Valhalla, just fighting and drinking up there, please. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> And then they burn everything, right? And then everything, the idea is everything, all the smoke kind of goes to heaven, it goes to Valhalla, and then it kind of, then you can enjoy all those things. So people are desperate. They use means that obviously are not going to work. I don't know if they believed it themselves, to be honest. Did they have that in Sweden as well, Eric? Did they do the same thing? Do you know about that? No. don't know about that? Okay, okay. So maybe, maybe the Swedish Vikings are wiser than the Norwegian Vikings. I don't know. And uh, so... We are desperate, but it shows 
the point is uh, people are not ready to let go when they die that is the point uh, yeah and uh, but you don't have any choice. You can burn as much paper money as you like. It's not going to help you. Yeah, it's going to be completely irrelevant. That's just Buddhism for you. And so we have to learn to let go when we die. And the only time you can learn to let go is now. You cannot wait till the day you are dying because then you don't know you're going to die. You don't know what's happening. All you know is going to happen at some time. So you have to do it now. If you wait too long, it's never going to happen. And so the idea then is to bring it into the present, uh, the idea of dying. Uh, yeah, okay, don't, don't, be too, don't make it too difficult for yourself. Uh, yeah, don't think I'm going to die in my next breath because that's, that's too, kind of, too immediate. Uh, but maybe next week or next month, yeah? What happens if I die next month? Uh, why am I thinking about all these things in the world if I could die next week? Uh, all of these things start to become irrelevant to you. Uh, yeah? Why, do I, why am I so concerned about all the issues in the world? Why am I so concerned about, uh, you know, about kind of uh, my house and my car and all of these kind of things? Uh, what do these things in the world really matter to me if I could die next week? Uh, chances are, if I die, I will never come back here anyway. I will come, go, be reborn somewhere else. It kind of becomes, all of these things become really irrelevant. Uh, if you think about your past lives, uh, what does your house in your past life, does that matter to you now? Uh, what about your family in the past life? What kind of, what, what does that to do with you now? Nothing. But you were really attached to those things in the past. And you can see now it seems really silly. Why was I attached to those things? I've become completely irrelevant. And so you bring that idea into the present life. And then you can start to let go a little bit. Yeah. And if you have that ability to let go now, if you bring that up now, then when you eventually do die, yeah, and it's going to happen to all of us, uh, then you will be able to let go. So it's a double benefit. You can use the idea of death now to enhance your meditation by letting go. And then when eventually uh, you have to die, you actually will have learned some of the process. Uh, and so one of the very interesting things in Buddhism is that dying and meditation uh, are very similar to each other. Uh, you die a little bit in meditation here. Uh, are you ready for that? Huh? <laughs> yes, some of you nod. Okay, that's wonderful. That means you have some understanding of what this is about, right? Uh, so dying and meditation is very similar. And what you find, and this is kind of the beautiful thing with this, uh, is that uh, you find that meditation, when you do die a little bit in a meditation, when you do let go, the result is so beautiful. Huh? Yeah, you feel peaceful, you feel at ease, you start to feel kind of coming back home to yourself in a certain way. All the superficial things in the world start to fade away. And then you know also, because of the relation to death, you know death too is going to be something nice. Yeah, It's a letting go of the burdens of the world, of a body that maybe is sick, of all the things, all the troubles in life, all of that can go. So that too then starts to become something potentially beautiful. If you live a good life, if you are a good person, then it tends to be beautiful and it tends to be a positive experience. That is the critical issue. So bring that into your meditation. Remind yourself yeah, that you, uh, you're going to die one day. Yeah, and see and remind yourself it can happen soon. What does that mean for my relationship to the world, to everything? And then you can see, feel sometimes the mind letting go, the mind becoming peaceful, because there is nothing really to worry about in this world, nothing really of importance. Forgive everyone. Forgive everyone. Forgive everyone, yeah. Especially yourself, yeah. Yourself and everyone else. Forgive the most bad person in the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. We can be my co-teacher next time. <laughs> that's good. So forgive everyone. Exactly. That's actually what happens. That's one of the results yeah, of this kind of death contemplation. You forgive and you, because letting go and forgiveness obviously go together. So that's precisely true. Yeah? And so this is the beginning of the idea of letting go. Yeah? Yeah? And then you find if that works for you, you start to relax, you start to become peaceful because you are letting go in this way. Yeah? then uh, you still find that there are more things to let go of. Yeah? When you're relaxing, one of the things that very commonly you will, uh, happens uh, is that you will tend to think a lot. Uh, does anyone have that problem in meditation? Thinking, yeah, yeah thinking, go up. <laughs> yeah? It's very, I think nobody, there's not, no such person in the world who hasn't had that problem in meditation. Uh, 
And this is kind of what is so beautiful. I, I, I've just been talking about this one sutta. I'm only doing a very short tour here in the UK. So I've been to London, went to Brighton yesterday. Was it yesterday? Yeah. Okay, Brighton yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday morning, that's right, the day before. Yeah. And uh, getting confused already. Huh? <laughs> so, and with this one sutta has been coming up in all these talks. And I think it's very nice to be aware of some of the things that you see in the suttas of the Buddha and see meditation from that point of view. And one of the things the Buddha says, it is found in a sutta called the Upakilesa Sutta, the corruptions of the mind, Majjhimanikaya 128. And um, this sutta, the Buddha talks about how to remove the refined defilements of the mind so as to enter deep samadhi. Yeah? What are the f refined things that block you from achieving deep samadhi? Yeah? And there the Buddha himself, yeah, and also Anuruddha, one of the greatest disciples of the, Bu of the Buddha, yeah, Anuruddha who had the divine eye, yeah, the Dibbachaku, uh, both of them say they're having difficulties, not the Buddha, but the Buddha to be, I should say, before he was the Buddha. After he was the Buddha, no problem, any meditation was accessible. But before that, uh, they were saying they're having problems uh, stabilizing the meditation. Uh, yeah, especially talking about the nimitta, the bright lights you can see in meditation, we're having problems stabilizing that. Uh, yeah, and one of those things was the mind was being restless and the mind moving, which is similar to thinking. Yeah. So even the Buddha to be, even Anuruddha, even these greatest kind of arahants in the history of Buddhism, were having problems with these kind of issues. Uh, so if you're having problem, again, you are in very good company if you have this, this kind of problem. Yeah, The Buddha to be had the same thing. So don't feel bad about that. Rather, do what the Buddha said you should do. Investigate why it is happening here. The Buddha says you should look for the cause and conditions why this is going on here. And so one of the reasons why we think about things is because of an interest in the the world, yeah, interest in your life, interest in your problems, interest in kind of the political issues everywhere, interest in all the things that are going on, interest in your work, problems to be solved, yeah. Uh, very often the mind will start to, once the mind becomes a little bit peaceful, the mind starts to solve problems, yeah, very, very common. So people, often meditation time is often problem solving time for people. Yeah? And that's why the mind kind of then goes around and around and around. This uh, circle is a nice word, Buddhist word for this. It's called papancha. Papancha is a word which means this proliferation of the mind, just going round and round and on and on. And so we want to cut some of that proliferation here. And one of the best ways of doing that uh, is to understand that your future, uh, yeah, what your future is going to be here. Uh, is not so much tied up with resolving all the problems in the world. Actually, it doesn't matter very much. What happens in the world, what happens in your life, okay, there is a problem. If you solve that problem, there's another problem waiting behind. Another problem waiting behind that one. There is no end point. It's just kind of going around in circles again and again and again, yeah, without kind of any goal or purpose or any kind of end point at all. And so once you start to understand that, that resolving the issues in your life or in the world or in whatever uh, is never going to get you to where you want to be, uh, then it starts to become less interesting. Uh, because what that means is that your future actually does not really depend on solving the problems. Uh, why? Well, because there are just more problems anyway. Uh, there is no end. Yeah, it just goes on and on and on. So your future, if you solve problems in meditation, the future of that is more problems to be solved in meditation in the future. That is really the future of that. Uh, but you're not doing anything really um, highly skillful uh, to get out of that. Uh. And so your future is not created by solving the problems of the world or thinking about them or indeed the problems in your life. Uh, your future is created by how you live. Uh. Yeah, the qualities of your heart, uh, the whether you live with compassion or not, uh, whether you have a degree of peace in your mind, uh, that is where your future is made. Uh. And this is uh, in idea, the idea of the Buddhist idea of kamma, yeah, or karma, if you like. Yeah. You make good karma here and now by being peaceful, by being kind, by doing good things. Uh. That good karma, part of that is that you feel more happy in this life. And if you feel more happy in this life, you are more resilient. And if you're more resilient, you can deal with the problems of the world in the right way. Through practicing the spiritual path, not by solving all of these issues while you sit in meditation thinking about things. 
So the solution is found in a very different place than often what, than, than what we think very often. Uh, the solutions are found on the spiritual path. Uh, yeah, And so you stop looking for solutions in the wrong place. Actually, if I become peaceful, uh, if I develop a heart of metta or compassion or whatever, then I will be able to solve these issues uh, in a very different way from what I thought. Uh, through clarity, through understanding, through building up with uh, inner resilience uh, in a world that often seems very harsh and unfair and unreasonable. Uh, and then also building up the qualities that lead to a good rebirth in the future. Uh, yeah, isn't that great? Uh, so stop thinking. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's what he's saying. There's no thinking, that's not going to work. Yeah. This is the way to actually achieve the outcome that you want, uh, because the outcome that we all want is really a good future. Uh, a good moving on to something positive. Eh? That is the idea here. Eh? And now you are starting to become quite peaceful. Yeah? If you're able to let go of the thinking mind in this way, eh? you're able to let go, you're able to relax properly. Eh? Yeah? This is a lot of letting go already. Eh? You really start to let go. There's one more thing eh, that sometimes we need to let go of, which also drives the thinking mind. Eh? And that is often our relationship with other people. Eh? Yeah, there may be some issues that you're thinking about where sometimes when we the mind goes idly, thinks about things that were unfair. Yeah, they, they treated me like this, they shouldn't have treated me like that. Uh, they have no right to treat me like this. Yeah, this is bad. Or or maybe you have feel a bit, bit sense of remorse because maybe you said something that was a little bit unskillful or whatever. Yeah, And so all of these things, the kind of the people issues, uh, all of that is uh, let go of by an act of forgiveness. Uh, yeah. Forgiving is very, very important on the Buddhist path. So please forgive. Yeah? Remember very simple ideas to help you forgive others is to remember that, first of all, people in the world, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah? People in the world, they're kind of walking around in delusion. They're walking around in darkness. No one really understands what life is about. No one, we're all kind of trying our best and very often we fail. So when someone treats you badly, it's not because they really want to treat you badly. It's because they haven't got a clue what's going on. That's the reason. Yeah, and that's kind of a nice way of thinking about other people. Yeah, so uh, when someone treats you badly, just think, okay, you haven't got a clue. Sorry, this, you know, this is not a good idea. You're causing suffering for yourself. And the moment you understand that this person who is treating you badly is actually causing suffering for themselves, uh, at that moment, compassion becomes possible. Uh, and then instead of being angry with them, upset in return and justifying yourself and allowing our ugly ego to get into the equation, yeah, instead of allowing that, uh, we actually find compassion for the other person instead. Uh. Also remember that uh, very often the reason why people become unreasonable and bad uh, is because they are suffering. Uh. Yeah, everyone is suffering. Sometimes we think I'm the only person who suffers uh, because we're much closer to our own suffering than we are to other people's suffering. Uh, remember, everyone is like you. Huh? Yeah, some people have more worse suffering than you, but everyone is like us, really. Huh? And I feel sorry for those people who are like me because sometimes a lot of suffering to be me as well. Huh? <laughs> so, yeah, so this is kind of the idea. Actually, huh? if you have the same problems that I have, huh? and maybe going through it at a different time, well, you are worthy of that compassion. Uh, because being a human being in this world, sometimes it's not too hard, but a lot of the time it's difficult. Uh. Every day we meet with issues and things we have to resolve. Uh. Every day we meet with people who are difficult. Uh. Yeah, it's only here in the Quaker's house you don't meet difficult people. Uh. Everywhere else, everywhere else you meet difficult people. Uh. Yeah, and so this is just the way life is. Uh. And then you can start to have compassion. When you have compassion, you can forgive because you understand people. Yeah. Uh, and then this also takes away so much of that papancha, the proliferation of the mind, that taught, you know, that uh, uh, ego, which is making itself felt. Papancha is always rooted in ego, the sense of self. Uh, the sense of self is one of these terrible things, uh, yeah, which is, uh, I don't know, I, it's kind of ugly, the ego. Uh, yeah, it kind of, it's hard, it, it lacks in compassion, it just wants to be, it's about me all the time, it's self-centered. Uh, there's something very ugly about the, the ego and the self. Uh, and so if we can overcome that a little bit, it's actually very beautiful. Uh, and I think you will all know, those of you who have meditated for a long time, that uh, when you become peaceful uh, and the ego starts to disappear, the ego manifests as the chatter of the mind. So when you become peaceful and the ego starts to disappear, uh, then it's actually very beautiful. Uh, yeah? And you start to understand why the ego is so problematic. Uh. So this is the uh, letting go side of things. Uh. 
So now, is that helpful? Is that how you know more about letting go? Okay, so this is a little bit about letting go. Uh, uh, of course, the, the, I'm just talking. So talking is one thing, doing is something else. So you're going to get a chance to do it <laughs> later on. Uh, um, so um, letting go. Then there's the other side of things, enjoyment, right? Uh, enjoying what we're doing here today. Uh, and this is where we come closer to the idea of sila. Actually, I should say, before I go to that, I should say that uh, uh, sila, the morality, the kindness is also very supportive of letting go, yeah? Because if you let go, uh, to enable that, uh, you have to f usually to feel good about yourself. Uh, if you feel good about yourself, you have an inner kind of resource you can lean on. That resource, leaning on that resource, allows you to let go of the things in life that are not so nice, not so pleasant, uh, because you have something else. Uh, if you haven't got anything to lean on, then the chatter of the mind, the holding on to things of the world, that is what you tend to lean on. And then you can't let it go because you haven't got something else. So uh, being kind, living well, also allows you to let go. But also it is very important for another reason. Uh, and that reason is simply that uh, when you are kind, when you do things that are good in the world, uh, you tend to feel good about yourself. Uh, yeah, and this is such an important point because once you start feeling good about yourself, once you make the present moment a pleasant moment, once you close your eyes, you allow the world to fade into the background, that root, that deep-seated good feeling about yourself comes back out again because the world kind of fades away. But you have an inner sense of uh, uh, self-worth because you have been living well in your life and that comes back uh, when all the troubles of the world fade away here uh, yeah they come to the fore again uh, and so this is uh, one of the reasons why sila is so important uh, because it allows us to enjoy it allows us to have a good time when we meditate uh, it allows the mind to indulge uh, in some of that happiness uh, that you find uh, uh, through that kind of sila and so developing the enjoyment side of uh, the meditation is really, really important because that becomes the glue that allows you to stay with a meditation object. Yeah? Mindfulness becomes fun when you're happy. Uh, staying with the breath becomes fun if the breath is kind of attractive uh, to hang out with. Uh, and then once you have gone to that point, then the whole path kind of opens up very beautifully. Uh, so let me, so apart from sila, I want to say just a few, I'm going to carry on maybe another 10 minutes and we can do half an hour guided meditation here. Um, so there are a number of ways of learning to enjoy. Yeah? And so I will kind of just give you some ideas how to learn the enjoyment in meditation here. And uh, one of the most important ways right here yeah, today is just to enjoy the good company here. Yeah, to enjoy the fact that you are with other people who are good people. Yeah. That already is a remarkable thing. Yeah. Yeah, when you sit in a group like this, uh, everyone here has an interest in the spiritual life, in the development of the mind. Uh, if you didn't have that interest, you wouldn't be here. Yeah, so guaranteed you have that interest. Uh, yeah. And anyone who has that sort of interest uh, is worthy of respect uh, because of that interest in the spiritual life. Uh, they are trying, every one of you is trying your very best uh, to live in a good way and to develop good qualities. Uh. So one of the most important things when we come together as a group like this uh, is to have this idea called the Kalyana Mitta Anusati in the suttas, the recollection of your good spiritual friends. Uh, yeah, and to rejoice in that uh, and to kind of have this feeling that now I'm here in this good company. What a wonderful thing that is. Uh, how hard it is to find friends like these ones yeah, in the world. Uh, it's rare to find this. Uh, Okay, you know, sometimes in daily life you have to deal with all kinds of people. You don't have to deal with them here. Here you can relax, you can feel at ease, you can be yourself and just kind of chill and kind of disappear into the background. You don't have to be anyone at all because you are with good people. Yeah, and so rejoice in that. And it's not just the people around you, but you can broaden out this idea of the Kalyanamitta and Usati to incorporate every, all kind of Buddhists around the world, all the Buddhists in your life, yeah, including the monastics if you like. Yeah? It's wonderful that there are monastics in the world who dedicate their life to spiritual practice. It's a great thing. And you find some very, very inspiring monastics in the world. Uh, I have chosen to stay with Ajahn Brahm in Perth because I always found Ajahn Brahm to be very inspiring. I've been with him for 30 years now. Uh, and he still, kind of, still, I, I, it hasn't really changed my, my estimation of him over all those years. Uh, and there are many others as well out there who practice really well. And then in the final 
the kind of the number one Kalyanamitta, the number one spiritual friend, the more important than anyone else, is the Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha is your spiritual friend. Have you ever thought about that before? And sometimes we think the Buddha is like a myth. The Buddha is something that happened two and a half thousand years ago. Who knows anything about the Buddha? Yeah, but the reality is, no, the Buddha is actually our teacher. Yeah, the Buddha, even though he existed two and a half thousand years ago, doesn't take away from the fact that we still have the word of the Buddha in the present day, and that that word of the Buddha is very profound and very beautiful and very uplifting and has all of these wonderful qualities to it. And so you take the Buddha as your spiritual friend, and taking the Buddha as your spiritual friend is like, okay, the greatest spiritual master in human history is my teacher. What? Is that true? Is that amazing? It's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's really, we, have some, we have no idea how amazing that is. How is that possible that the greatest spiritual genius in the history of humanity is my teacher, is our teacher? It's kind of absolutely astonishing. Yeah, and sometimes it's because we don't fully understand what we are in the presence of. Yeah, That is why we don't fully appreciate and get lots of joy just by that thought, just that idea of having access to these teachings. When I was in Sri Lanka recently, I go to Sri Lanka quite regularly, once, you know, once a year, once every couple of years or whatever, and I was there I was talking to a monk. And this monk, he actually happened to be Danish, but he's lived in Sri Lanka most of his life. And uh, this monk, he told me that uh, when he was a young man, he was a bit of a hippie and all of these kind of things. Uh, and he said to me that, you know, just even when I was young, uh, when I was a bit of a hippie, because hippies are often into, you know, the little bit of spirituality and they did some meditation, they did some, some weird stuff as well, but they, did, they were certainly into some good, many good things. Uh, and he said that in those days when he was reading books about meditation and spirituality, uh, just the idea just the thought that there are people in the world yeah, who practice meditation uh, and who access deep stages of samadhi and kind of a different reality from the humdrum reality of ordinary life. Uh, he said just that thought uh, made him happy, uh, made him blissful. Isn't that amazing that people are have access to something more than ordinary life, uh, to something that is truly meaningful and truly uplifting? Uh, and he have, of course he has a point. Uh, but the, the problem is that those people that he was thinking about at that time, ordinary people back in the 1960s, they are nothing compared to the Buddha. If those people are enough to make you uplifted, then thinking about the Buddha should make you a thousand times more uplifted. Yeah, We have access to teachings that point to the highest kind of happiness, to the path out of suffering, to um, the meaning of life itself. Yeah, That is what the Buddha's teachings are about. And that's kind of awesome yeah it's like amazing yeah it's I, i'm not sure what the right superlative is the highest superlative you can think of it is magnificent it is splendiferous i don't know <laughs> yeah it's just yeah it's just kind of really 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 amazing and now somehow we have found our way to these teachings yeah you're all here it means you have access to these teachings isn't that kind of amazing? I sometimes wonder how I ended up as a Buddhist monk. I can't explain it. If you try to ask me, I have no idea. I grew up in this God-forsaken country called Norway. Literally God-forsaken, and no one is interested in religion. That is not where I grew up. Absolutely God-forsaken. If it is even more Buddha-forsaken, than it is God-forsaken. <laughs> no Buddhism whatsoever. And somehow I ended up looking like this. Yeah? And that's kind of, I find that really amazing. And we, somehow we all have made our way to these teachings. We have found our way to something truly profound and beautiful and exceptional. It is worthy of just, wow, how amazing that is. Now I am in the presence of, more than anything else, you are in the presence of the Buddha. Because my job is really just to express the teachings of the Buddha to you. Yeah, that's kind of my job as a mon monastic. Yeah. And so that is what we have here today. Yeah. And see if you can just try to understand what that means. It means that your life suddenly has meaning. It means that your life suddenly has a purpose. It has a goal. It has a direction to it. And it's not just the humdrum realities of ordinary existence. We're often just kind of just going back and forth, not going anywhere. Now, actually, something is really happening in your life. What an amazing thing that is.
And so this is how you then can bring up joy and happiness in your meditation, by thinking about things in this way, yeah? looking at life in a different way from what we ordinarily do. So that is uh, one way of doing this. Uh, there are many more ways in the suttas. Another way, which is kind of tangential to all of this, uh, is to have a sense of gratitude. Yeah? Gratitude in the suttas is called a superior human quality. Uh, so if you have gratitude, it means that you are, yeah, you're already doing really well. Uh, gratitude for being here. Uh, gratitude for just having the opportunity to do this sort of thing. Uh, gratitude to yourself, yeah, for bringing yourself here. Yeah, in the end, you have to take credit for coming here, so that's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> so you have, it's gratitude to yourself, gratitude to the Buddha, to the Dhamma, to the Sangha, to all of these things coming together in the present. Uh, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, and when you feel a sense of gratitude, gratitude for people who who kind of have kept this place for spiritual meetings, yeah, to the Quakers. Allowing us to come here is not obvious, yeah, Quakers, they're not Buddhists, and so, but still they allow us to come here. I, the other day I was in Brighton, just uh, yesterday morning, yeah, and uh, the night before I gave a Dhamma talk. On the way to the Dhamma talk, I was kind of walking down the street, I was walking by myself. Sometimes it's nice to walk by yourself, but then you can kind of do more random stuff. And so I, I walk in, and then I got to this place, yeah, and it said the kind of kar, uh, Kadampa Meditation Center, yeah, so I walked in, and it was really, really kind of this posh place, where it kind of looked very expensive and nice, and big gardens and everything, and so I walked in, and, and they looked very, very friendly, very nice, and then I asked them, oh, you know, would you rent out this place in the future, or, oh, no, no, we don't rent out to anyone apart from ourselves. I kind of, I thought that was a bit sad, yeah. And so it's beautiful that we are here and we kind of work together in this way here. And the Quakers actually are open to this. It's wonderful. We should have that openness in our lives. It makes it beautiful. And then the Buddha, and I will talk more about this this afternoon because we're going to have another short talk this afternoon. And the idea is also of thinking about the fact that you are now living a good life. Yeah, and allowing yourself to rejoice in the fact of your own, of living well, yeah? Not the kind of egocentric idea that I'm really wonderful and great, but more a quiet sense of satisfaction within yourself, knowing that you're keeping your precepts, knowing that you're trying to be kind, and also the same thing also emerging from your generosity. Generosity is a very, very important part of the Buddhist path, and it feeds back into your meditation when you get it right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so these are just some uh, short, just a uh, little bit of guidance uh, on uh, how to go about the meditation. Uh, so now let's try it out in practice. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, as always with uh, meditation, just start by uh, sitting comfortably uh, and find a nice comfortable posture for yourself. Uh, uh, reasonably straight so that your mind is uh, reasonably clear uh, and uh, whatever uh, posture you can sustain maybe for about 30 minutes uh, so fairly short meditation this morning here yeah. Okay, so then uh, as you close your eyes, you can feel your body uh, quite well. Uh, and so you will know whether you have any uh, tensions or problems in the body, any pains or whatever. Uh, so take the opportunity just to adjust yourself and uh, to kind of find just the right way of sitting. Uh, and then uh, when you sit right, uh, then the next thing then is to allow yourself to relax. Uh, and very often it's just a matter of allowing yourself uh, 
stopping the kind of controlling part of the mind, uh, allowing that gradually, gradually just to die away here. And again, uh, initially, when you start out, uh, it can be useful to use the idea of, you know, relaxing in an armchair after work and reminding yourself what exactly it is that you do, or rather don't do, when you sit down like that. Uh, just allow things to flow, uh, allow things to settle on their own. Uh, don't feed the process too much, of course, uh, don't try to feed anything, uh, but just uh, uh, sitting down and letting things be. Uh, always a good start for meditation practice. Uh, And uh, just uh, feel your body and mind. Uh, uh, with that feeling, you also are kind of drawing the mind into the present. Uh, because that's obviously, instead of fantasizing about things, uh, you're staying with something that really is here right now. Uh, so just feel yourself first of all. Uh, feel the body. Uh, and then as you feel, you bring a bit of gentle awareness to whatever heavy feelings there might be. Uh, and with that gentle awareness, just gradually allow those feelings to dissipate. Uh, just by being patient, uh, being aware, uh, not doing anything, uh, and adding this gentleness, uh, slowly, slowly things become more light and easy. Uh.
and uh, at the beginning allow the mind to drift uh, if the mind wants to drift uh, if the mind drifts too much uh, come back to the feelings in the body uh, it becomes like an anchor point that you can take stock of the meditation uh, and also know whether you're heading in the right way uh, if you feel at ease and comfortable uh, you know the mind is roughly in the right place uh, if you don't feel that uh, then more letting go is required uh, so again just be patient uh, and allow things to be here uh, but generally speaking go with the flow of things in the beginning here uh, And uh, as you start to feel more comfortable, uh, then uh, the idea is to gradually allow the mindfulness to become established. Uh, and the way to do this is often just to be the observer in the meditation. Uh, just observe, uh, standing back, allowing things to come and go, uh, whether they are external sounds, uh, whether they are the thinking mind, uh, even if it is the tiredness of the mind, uh, whatever it might be, uh, your job is just to observe. Uh, and as you become good at observing, uh, these things lose the uh, impact they usually have on the mind. Uh, they lose the force uh, and you become more uh, detached, uh, more at ease. Uh, you kind of flow, go with the flow without resisting, uh, without allowing these things to disturb you. Uh, you're like a passenger on a train. Uh, this beautiful idea of just looking at the, out the window, uh, whatever comes your way, uh, you have no choice but to see just that. Uh, the same thing with meditation, uh, you're just an observer. Uh, the things of the world are just like the wind in the trees. Uh, you can't um, order these things around uh, and so you just allow it to be here. Uh,
And uh, if you are able just to stay with the present in this way, uh, just observing things coming and going, uh, is this like a little miracle of mindfulness gradually becoming established. Uh, and uh, to improve that process, uh, to take it further, uh, make sure that you enjoy what is going on. Uh, get this feeling of what it means just to observe. Uh, there's no effort there, there's no trying, there's no will. Uh, and there's something very attractive uh, about not doing anything uh, about being the observer in life rather than the doer in life. Uh, the observer is so much more relaxed than it is. Uh, the doer is always involved in the things of the world. Uh, so experience, if you can, that uh, pleasure, that satisfaction uh, of not being a doer, uh, of merely being an observer. Uh, and as you do that, you start to understand what meditation really is about. Uh, and then take this uh, as far as you can. Uh, just this pleasure of not having anything to do in the whole world, uh, no activity, uh, just sitting down and being aware, uh, understanding why that is so pleasurable. Uh, and if you understand that, you start to understand the idea of meditation itself. Uh. And uh, you may find that you need a bit more energy in the meditation. Uh, and to do that, uh, just find something that you find positive to focus on. Uh, focus on some of the ideas I talked about before. Uh, just the enjoyment of good spiritual friendship. Uh, the idea of uh, gratitude for what is happening here. Uh, the idea of just reflecting on something you have done in your life. Uh, that really lifted you up uh, and made you a more bright person. Uh, by bringing these ideas back very gently, uh, not by thinking a lot, but by merely nudging the mind in that direction. Uh, see if you can get the energy level to uh, increase a little bit. Uh.
And uh, as you practice in this way, uh, there often comes a time when the mind becomes uh, maybe reasonably clear. Uh, it's as if you have been waiting for the breath to appear properly, to become distinct, uh, to become an object you can focus on. Uh, and when you feel that this is happening, uh, then in a sense you are already doing the breath meditation. Uh, so just wait for the breath to become apparent in this way. Uh, wait for the breath to become clear. Uh, and then the breath meditation is happening. Uh, and when you watch the breath, uh, it is very important to do this in the right way. Uh, do it with a sense of detachment. Uh, do it as if you are observing an object uh, that has nothing to do with you. Uh, as if you are uh, looking at a tree in the forest uh, or feeling or hearing the wind in the leaves. Uh, in the same way, the breath is not really yours anymore. Uh, it's just an object of awareness. Uh, you're not in charge. Uh, you're not controlling it. Uh, you're merely aware of it like any other natural phenomenon in the world. Uh, and then you can have an easy, nice, pleasant uh, relationship with your breath. Uh.
Okay, so now just uh, take a minute just to review the meditation. Uh, I recommend this after every meditation, uh, just to try to understand the process. Uh, and what we are trying to understand is how letting go happens, uh, what it means, uh, how do you develop your perceptions, uh, how do they support the meditation. Uh, so just take a few seconds just to uh, stay in meditation, uh, reviewing the process. Uh, Okay, everyone, so that's uh, it, it for now. Huh? So um, please uh, just carry on uh, whatever way you like. Uh, there's possibilities of doing some walking meditation if you like, or you can carry on sitting. Uh, and uh, we will go off to have our lunch, and then uh, I think in half an hour's time it's, uh, it's your turn over there. Uh, and we meet back again quarter past one. Yeah, so quarter past one, we'll meet you back here again. Do you want to say a few words on walking meditation? Uh, or shall I just say? You, you can say a few words, okay. yeah, please go So through. walking meditation yeah. basically follows the same principles as all meditation. So it's just another opportunity to relax your mind and to allow the mindfulness to continue to develop. And it's a very beautiful way of meditating because most of our day actually we're usually either sitting or we're on our feet. And so it's not only something to fill in the gaps between the sittings, but it's something to maintain continuity and even to build the mindfulness a little bit more because there's a bit more going on. So the idea of walking meditation is to take a piece of uh, ground or path or grass if it's uh, stopped raining. Hopefully the rain davers have stopped and the sun davers are going to come out soon. <laughs> And um, just take a length of maybe, it's not a huge place, so maybe 10 steps or so, and try to walk uh, probably along the, um, the shorter length, say, of the, of the garden, so many of you can fit in. And you simply start at one end by standing and feeling your feet on the ground, establishing mindfulness of your posture, and then enjoying taking a step and just noticing the feelings in the feet. This is usually um, what's most predominant in the walking posture. So the feelings in the foot as it lifts, as it moves and as it touches the ground. You'll notice the weight changing, maybe the temperature, any feelings that you can notice as you do the walking meditation. And then you get to the end of your little path. You can re-establish your mindfulness, just be aware that you're now standing, and then gradually turn around and come back. But it differs from walking in daily life because you're not trying to get anywhere. You're simply trying to arrive with each movement, each step, if you like. And um, one thing to be aware of is that you'll probably find you're walking quite a bit slower simply because the distance is, is short. But just uh, notice if tension starts to creep in, because what I've noticed is if the mind gets really quiet, I tend to go more slowly, but I can start to be a little bit tense because you sort of can get too much into the actual movement and not into the mindfulness. So just widen your awareness if that happens and keep the whole thing relaxed. Does that make sense? Yeah? And the main thing again is to relax and to enjoy. So just see how that goes.